Hi, this will be the continuation of your discussion on the disturbances of esophagus. We have discussed your gastroesophageal reflux disease. This time we'll be talking about your hiatal hernia. Your hiatal hernia is also known as your diaphragmatic hernia. It's referred to as diaphragmatic because in this case, we are looking at the hiatus in the diaphragm. If you can recall in your anatomy, the hiatus is where the esophagus enters through the diaphragm so that it can go in the abdominal area. Now, when I talk about hiatal hernia, it is a condition wherein a part of the stomach protrudes through the diaphragm into the thorax. If you would look at the image shown on the slide, you can see that the normal anatomy on your left okay, would show the stomach below the diaphragm. Whereas on your right, you can see that a part of the stomach has protruded through the diaphragmatic hiatus. And this is because of the weakening of the muscles of your diaphragm. Now, risk factors. The risk factors would include aging. Usually, this is more common among old adults. Trauma. An excessive trauma on the abdomen will cause too much pressure in such a way that the stomach might go above your diaphragm than congenital muscle weakness. If you can recall, your diaphragm is a muscle. So whenever there is a weakness on that muscle, the tendency for the stomach to prolapse upward, then increase abdominal pressure, then surgery. There are surgery that may cause weakening of the muscles of the diaphragm. There are surgeries or repairs that can cause increased pressure in the abdomen. This slide recaps the explanation that the weakness in the diaphragm along with the increased intra-abdominal pressure can cause protrusion of lower esophagus and stomach above the diaphragm, hence resulting to hiatal hernia and its signs and symptoms. Before we proceed to the specific signs and symptoms, let us know the two types of hernia. There are actually three. So you have your sliding, rolling, and then your mixed type of hernia. Your sliding hernia is most common type. Okay, It's even seen among 95% of the uh, cases according to your Brunner and Sudar textbook. Okay, it is where the portion of the stomach slides upward through the diaphragm and into the chest. So the picture here shows your sliding hernia. Okay, what happened is that part of the stomach has slided up through the diaphragm. Okay, the common clarification for this one is the development of your esophageal reflux. Because as you can see, it is the part of the stomach that went up and then the esophageal or the lower esophageal sphincter could still be found here meaning the acid contents of this part could possibly go to your esophagus, okay, causing signs and symptoms such as that of your GERD. Then, you have your paraesophageal hernia, also known as your rolling hernia. Okay? So your rolling hernia happens when the gap in the phrenoesophageal portion of the stomach herniates into the chest alongside the esophagus. So as you can see, this area here is referred to as your phrenoesophageal portion. So what happened is that a portion of the stomach herniates into the chest okay, alongside the esophagus. So if you would compare your sliding hernia and your rolling hernia, okay, in your sliding hernia, a part of the stomach moved up. It pushed the esophagus up. But in this case, a part of the stomach protruded to the diaphragm. Okay, and that protrusion lies alongside your esophagus. And it stays there. The junction between the stomach and the esophagus still remains below the diaphragm. Okay, so if you would look at it, your lower esophageal sphincter is still here. Okay, so in your rolling or paraesophageal hernia, it is the fundus of the stomach that rolled into the thorax through a weakness in the diaphragm, causing a herniation next to the esophagus. So it is referred to as paraesophageal because it is beside your esophagus, also referred to as your rolling hernia. Now, the common complication for this one is strangulation and obstruction. If you would look at this, there is a very high tendency that the blood flow going towards this part of the body, which has already protruded abnormally to the upper part of the diaphragm, would have decreased blood flow. Okay, so later on when their patients are opened up, the tendency is that this area will turn purplish if not addressed accordingly. So the incidence is at around 5 to every 1,000 population. However, it is increased to 60% of clients over 60. Okay, so you also have your mixed hernia. Your mixed hernia, which is a larger defect, okay, occurs if the junction between the stomach and esophagus can herniate. So it's just a combination of your paraesophageal and sliding hernia. Okay, so other references would say that there are four types of hernia. Type 1 refers to your sliding hernia. Your type 2, 3, and 4 refers to your paraesophageal hernia. Okay, type 4 has an inclusion already of other abdominal contents, including that of your colon and spleen. 
So we can say that the higher the type, the higher the number of the type, the more severe and the more organs are protruding towards the diaphragm. Etiology. So the basic explanation here is that there is weakness of the muscles in the esophageal hiatus or your diaphragmatic hiatus which loosens the esophageal support. This allows the lower portion of the stomach to rise into your thorax. Primary prevention. So weight loss is recommended. Activities which increase intra-abdominal pressure must be avoided. So that would include stooping, bending down, sudden rigorous activities addressed towards the abdomen. Okay, your exercises or abdominal exercises, they may be placed on hold temporarily. Now for the assessment findings. As you can recall in a sliding hernia, the signs and symptoms will be like of your gastroesophageal reflux disease. So heartburn 30 to 60 minutes after meals is expected. The reflux, which is caused by the elevation of your lower esophageal sphincter along with part of your stomach, may cause substernal pain on the part of your patient. Your patient will also experience intolerance to food, nausea, and vomiting is also common. Your patient may also experience vague signs and symptoms of intermittent fullness, also pyrosis or your heartburn, regurgitation, then you have your dysphagia, and then there are patients who remain to be asymptomatic. Then, for your rolling or parasophageal hernia, you would expect no reflux or minimal reflux compared to your sliding hernia. Your patient would complain of feeling of fullness after eating, and then your patient would present with signs and symptoms of chest pain and anginal pain. One thing that is dangerous in your rolling or paraesophageal hernia is what you refer to as your obstruction. Okay, then you have your strangulation and then possibly hemorrhage. Okay, so again, this is because of the elevation of your gastric contents or your stomach part above the diaphragm. And possibly the diaphragmatic hiatus as a muscle may compress the blood flow going to this part of the stomach. Now, let's go to the management. Okay, so again, this is the differentiation of your sliding hernia and then your paraesophageal or rolling hernia. So, for the diagnostic studies, you have your x-ray and your barium swallow with fluoroscopy. As you can see on your x-ray on the left, there is a space here, okay, which indicates that an air-filled organ may have elevated above the diaphragm. Mm -hmm. Okay? And then on this part on your right, you are showing, uh, you are seeing a barium swallow, which is taken also after an x-ray. So the diagnostic studies are x-ray and barium swallow with fluoroscopy. So this is the part of the stomach which has protruded beside the esophagus. So what will be our management for this patient? Diet therapy and medications, just like your GERD. So you would advise your patient to avoid spicy food. You also advise them to avoid chocolates for that matter. Then medications would include administration of your anticholinergics. There will be administration of your proton pump inhibitors. Then for the health teaching, when they're sleeping, the head of bed should be elevated by six inches. Purpose, to prevent reflux. Upright position, also after hours after eating. What's the purpose? Also to prevent reflux. Then, no straining, no vigorous exercises, no tight clothing, especially on the part of the abdomen because that can increase your intra-abdominal pressure, increasing the risk for reflux. Then for the surgical management, we have your laparoscopic Nissen von duplication. Remember, your Nissen von duplication is also the management of choice for your GERD. In this case, your laparoscopic Nissen von duplication is used to reduce, when I say reduce, to return that part which has protruded above the diaphragm to where it's supposed to be. Your laparoscopic Nissen von duplication is preferred compared to the open Nissen von duplication. The open Nissen von duplication is only used if the patient has bleeding, adhesions, injury, or if we are exploring, for example, gastric outlet obstruction, gastric strangulation, ischemia, necrosis, and perforation. So, for example, upon ultrasound, the doctor has seen that there is no adequate flow of blood going towards the paraesophageal hernia. They need to do an open laparoscopic. Uh, open surgery rather than laparoscopic. But regardless, if it is a simple case, there are no complications, laparoscopic surgery is recommended. So post-op care, you watch out for bleeding, you again watch out for presence of infection and injury to other organs. Then common complications after this, you have your temporary dysphagia, you have your gas bloat syndrome, and then you also have your atelectasis or pneumonia. Try to rationalize how come a patient would undergo Nissen von duplication would have these complications, such as your temporary dysphagia, gas, gas bloat syndrome, and then atelectasis or pneumonia. The common 
nursing diagnosis for this patient would include risk for aspiration related to reflux of your gastric contents, imbalanced nutrition, less than body requirements because or related to feeling of fullness after eating a meal, acute pain related to okay, your paraesophageal hernia or the structural protrusion of your hernia above the abdomen, knowledge deficit related to diet okay, and your lifestyle changes, and then anxiety and fear related to undergoing surgery. Another important nursing diagnosis that we might consider is ineffective tissue perfusion, especially if we're talking about your paraesophageal hernia. Okay, so I hope that this has uh, differentiated to you your sliding hernia and your paraesophageal hernia. The next topic that we will have is your impaired esophageal motility disorder. Here we will discuss your achalasia and then your DES or your diffuse esophageal spasms. Thank you very much for your kind attention.